five. Is it you that killed off Cleverly? That's what people are saying. Four. And my quick reaction was, James Cleverly? <laughs> Dear God. Three. We would remember if people in London poured onto the streets to celebrate Crystal Mac, and so we should remember that they did it for 7th of October. Conservatives have learnt nothing, have listened to nobody and still think they can carry on as normal, but just with a change of front man. One. We have left off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. Here on Planet Normal, it's all eyes on the Conservative Leadership Contest with MPs having decided in just the last few minutes, we're recording this on Wednesday late afternoon, that Robert Jenrick and Kemi Badenoch will now be put before Tory party members. First Tom Toonhat and now James Cleverley, two candidates more from the left of the Tory party have been eliminated. Grassroots Conservatives will now choose between Jenrick and Badenoch with the new leader of His Majesty's opposition to be announced in early November. Meanwhile, even though the Tories are still leaderless, Keir Starmer, whose Labour Party only in July won a stonking 170-seat majority, is now just one point ahead in the opinion polls. Labour's on just 29%, with the Tories on 28 And the big news is that Nigel Farage's Reform Party, with just five MPs, is polling third on 19%. All this is grim reading for Starmer after his chief of staff resigned last Sunday amidst vicious Downing Street infighting. And the party's being heavily criticised for removing the winter fuel allowance from some pensioners, part of what Alison has dubbed Labour's war on the old in her latest Telegraph column. And maybe in a bid to divert the media's attention and push sleazy donations and government chaos out of the headlines, the government's now launched legislation on assisted dying. Something else you focused on, Alison, in Wednesday's Telegraph. So much to discuss. But before we get stuck in, tell us about your weight loss campaign. How's Fatty's little helper? <laughs> Well, you do know that Robert Jedrick WhatsApp me recently <laughs> saying that he'd realised that he, Robert, and me, Alison, we're now the pin-ups for the <laughs> Munjaro weight loss. You're the Azempic twins. The Azempic <laughs> twins, yeah. Well, it's it has been going very well, a little bit, little bit slowly. It's quite funny, Liam, because wherever I go, people sort of sidle up and they say, you know, how much have you lost? <laughs> Come on, spill the beans, spill the beans, scores uh, on the doors. Scores on the doors. What am I? I am, hang on a minute. So I am 16 and a half pounds down. Wow. That's that's quite a few bags of sugar, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. My jumper today is very baggy. What else would I say? Yeah, feeling feeling good actually going to the gym to try and do... It's important to counteract, not, not something I've ever had to say before, muscle wastage. Or the chocolate that you're mainlining. <laughs> oh, muscle wastage. Muscle wastage. <laughs> so you've got doing lots of... No, I can't walk from all the dreadful leg exercises, but no, feeling very, very healthy. But we should tell Planet Normal listeners that we had a very funny moment, didn't we? Because with our joint weight loss efforts. So I have lost... Go on, say what you had for your tea on I will, Sunday. I will, I, will, I, will, I will literally spill the beans on... Yeah, you will literally spill <laughs> <laughs> Go on. I've gone down from 123 kilos since we started our campaign to 117 kilos. So Ooh. I've lost six kilos without Fatty's little helper... Eau Sauvage, Commando, just willpower. (laughs) And we are, of course, and we will continue to deliberately compare our weight loss in confusingly different units in order that we can't really compare. But this is serious. This is serious because in a bit to intimidate you, on Sunday night, I rang you up and told you, I'm so serious about this weight loss campaign. For my Sunday dinner, I had beans on toast. And then you revealed... (laughs) I was having beans on toast. <laughs> you were also having beans on toast. So I thought I was wielding my most powerful weapon against you, you know, <laughs> and then you had matched it. But look, the Tories, eh? Oh. Politics. Is it you that killed off cleverly? That's what people are saying. So <laughs> listeners, Telegraph readers may have seen that as I was coming to the end of the day yesterday, they said James Cleverly had surged to the top of the leaderboard for the Tory leadership candidates. And they said, Alison, can you write a quick reaction? And my quick reaction was James Cleverly. 
dear God. So I let them have it with the usual Pearson double barrel shotgun, as you know, Halligan. I, I actually I feel so relieved because I think he would have been such a bad choice. He would have been proof that the Conservatives have learnt nothing, have listened to nobody and have just come through this absolute historic electoral drubbing and still think they can carry on as normal, but just with a change of front man. That's literally what it was going to be, isn't it? I think that's right. It's clear to me, having spent a lot of time at Tory party conference, talking to activists, local party members, rather than the big political beasts who were very much kept behind um, security and, and so on. It was hard to get close to leadership candidates. I did talk to all of them, but I spent a lot of time Quite, you know, in the nicest possible way, fending off Planet Normal listeners who are coming up to me and for the most part asking me where you were. <laughs> We've got some very nice emails from people who rubbed shoulders with you, obviously much diminished shoulders now, just living off mung but beans it, alone. But, but it was absolutely clear, talking to those activists, Alison, that a common theme was people saying, I want Kemi and if I don't get the chance to vote for Kemi, I'm going to go to reform. Yeah. And then you said you said something along very similar lines, didn't you, in your reaction piece to news cleverly surge? <laughs> yeah, I think that if they hadn't put Kemi through, there would be absolute uproar because I think that many of the party members have been waiting to vote for Kemi since 2022, which will you'll remember was the Liz Truss, Rishi Sunak standoff. And Kemi wasn't put through then by the MPs. And I think a lot of the party members who actually have some quite good instincts about this, Liam, they wanted to vote for her then. So they have been patiently waiting. And quite honestly, I think they're well. I mean, I was going to say there'd be a, a mass exit of Tory party members, but there's only about there's only about three left, aren't there, really? Um, but we have to at some point speculate about who is the one point that, that makes up Keir Starmer's lead over the leaderless <laughs> Conservatives. Could that be Sue Gray and her son, who was locked out? With the prime <laughs> Labour parliamentary seat. Uh, on the, this, we can't speculate. So, yes, I think it's uh, it's the best result. It's the result I hope for. Uh, Planet Normal listeners will know we had uh, Robert Jenrick on last week giving a very thoughtful and uh, generous interview. He's probably had the most successful campaign, I would say. Robert and his team have done a huge amount of thinking. And he, of course, has majored, Liam, as you know, on thinking about immigration and illegal asylum, which is music to the Conservative base's ears, but also now is leading in almost every political group. And let me just, let's do, should we have time for a quick Velma stat? Yes, go for it. <laughs> Scooby. Yes, Scooby. Okay, Velma Stat. So this Don't week... Don't dismiss Scooby with just an okay, you know. Lovely. <laughs> so Oxford University research this week says we have some 745,000 illegal migrants living here in the UK. That is double the number in France. And other analysis suggests the true figure may be closer to 1.2 million illegal migrants. That's the size of Birmingham. Absolutely unreal how many in 100 people. Is it one in 100 people in the UK are illegal migrants? And just to say that nearly 68 asylum claims were granted in the year to June, and that is more than triple the 21,436 asylum claims approved in the previous year. This is an absolute crisis, Liam, and no wonder they're trying to nick the old people's winter fuel allowance because they've got an awful lot of illegal migrants to put up in nice accommodation with food, haven't they? So absolutely, this just coming back now to this Tory leadership, it's, there's going to be an awful lot of discussion. I'll tell you what I'm relieved about. Let me just say the scores on the doors, Alison, because we haven't said that. And Planet Normal listeners have probably got better things to do than memorise these numbers. So Kemi topped the poll of Tory MPs with 42 votes. Robert Jenrick came a close second with 41. And James Cleverly lost support, actually, in the final round and got 37 votes. I agree with you that Robert Jenrick grew the most during the campaign and ran the best campaign. But I do actually think it's significant that Kemi came top. And I think most people would now expect her to win among the constituents, certainly if 
lots of the polling evidence of recent months and months actually is true. And I think it is interesting that MPs who we expected to fight against the more right-wing candidates, they have actually put through the two candidates who are broadly on the right among the original five that stood. And maybe that suggests that they are understanding that the Overton window has shifted and they really now have to take the battle to reform if they can have any chance of forming a government. Because it does, it's not out of the question now, as we've been saying for a long time on Planet Normal, pretty much since a week or two after that early July election, this could now be a one-term government. How has it come to the fact that Labour's just one point ahead in the polls? It's astonishing after less than three months. Well, you know what you're saying is astonishing, but it isn't really astonishing because, as you've said on multiple occasions, if you actually look at how many votes Labour got, the the number of seats, of course, is enormous. But the level of support in the country for Starmer was exceedingly shallow, even when he won that victory. And his personal ratings, given this sort of sequence of absolutely mad sleaze, he's never going to live down the who paid for that, you know, who paid for those glasses. Who paid for your wife's dress. <laughs> who paid for your wife's dress, particularly at a time when it's, you know, we're going to have pensioners freezing to death because they've nicked their 300 quid winter fuel allowance. These things, there's a concatenation of really pongy stories, which I think have affected the perception. So this first hundred days has been a calamity. What was that word? Concatenate. What's that? Concatenation. I don't know. It's just a, it's just a, it's a sequence, a sequence. I, I don't know what it is, a concatenate. It's a coming are, are together. You trying to, are you trying to resurrect Call My Bluff or something? <laughs> you think you're Frank Muir? <laughs> oh, I wrote about Frank Muir Patrick Muir. Remember that? Yeah, That's the most like... polite of all panel games ever. I love I that. Loved that. I love, I love that. that. Anyway, um, carry on with your whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, your just series. to say, so it's very hard to tell but obviously membership of the Conservative Party has dropped, you know, enormously. And so before, I would have said that you could have relied on the Conservative members to go for the most sort of solidly right-wing candidate. Now, because so many have either defected to reform, which we obviously yeah, we that's saw, true. During, that's true. saw during the election, four million voted for reform, and many of those will have been, many of the people who've written to us, disillusioned Conservative voters, but also obviously a large number, at least a couple of million former Tory voters who refused to vote at all. So I think it, it's harder now. It's harder now to predict what the members will do. And indeed, there's not a very big number of them, but they have been incredibly annoyed, as you know, because Rishi Sunak was installed in a coronation, absolutely having nothing to do with the members. And coming back to what you said, Liam, about the MPs that they have put, obviously put Kemi and Robert Jenrick through, as I wrote in my column, it's a question of survival. If they had put Cleverly through, because he's sort of a good bluff fellow you might like to have a pint with in the saloon bar, if they'd literally chosen on that basis, and he was the one candidate who was refusing, would sort of say, if only we'd been more unified, conservatism with a smile, all this absolutely hopeless, no analysis of why they'd had this brutal rejection, no plan for putting it right and getting back on the front foot with the voters. And I, I think it's quite exciting. I think there's everything to play for now. I absolutely think a really good new Conservative leader can knock nine bells out of Starmer. I really do. He's such a bad, wooden performer. Labour is reeling. We've got, obviously, we've got Rachel Reeves's budget of doom <laughs> coming up on the 30th of October. I only wish that, that one of the candidates was installed by then. Robert Jenrick told us last week he agreed with you. It was madness to not just... I mean, they could do it in a week, Liam, couldn't they? We convinced two Tory leadership candidates to call publicly for this leadership contest to be brought forward. So the members vote by the middle of October or maybe a week before the budget on the 30th of October. So at least you've got a leader of the opposition because, of course, leaders of the opposition respond to budgets. And this 30th of October budget is going to be really serious. Just on James Cleverly, I agree with you, it would have been strategically inept 
for the Tory MPs to have put him through. But I do think he's a sure-footed communicator and I do think he'll figure prominently on and should on the Tory front bench going forward. And he has enhanced his reputation during this leadership contest, Alison, even if not with you. And talking of reputation, He hasn't with me. <laughs> Come on. He was a very bland foreign secretary, much liked by the civil servants because he did as he was told. And he, what did he do as Home Secretary? Let him one and a half million people into the country? No, thank you, Halligan. Let's turn your guns, right? I'm, I'm, it's, it's a war movie. I'm on the deck of a ship and I'm sort of sitting with a gun. Sort of, My right hand is sort of rotating fast with a sort of wheel with a handle on, shifting the howitzer. Or you don't have howitzers on boats, but you know what I mean. Away from James Cleverly for a moment and the Pearson guns are now be trained in your crosshairs, Rachel Reeves, because ahead of this budget, and I wrote about this last Sunday, we can put the link in the show notes of this episode, There is now growing concern on government bond markets. What does that mean? The nooms of Zurich, as we used to call them in the 70s. The investors, the pension funds, the life funds, and so on, that buy government debt, buy gilts, as it were. The government sells its debt to international investors, and they then get an income stream off that debt in the form of interest payments. This is how government finance works around the world, and yields the price that investors demand to lend to the government are going up on 10-year UK gilts because the market is getting increasingly alarmed because as growth fails to break through, as inflation stubbornly doesn't go away, and we've had an oil price spike in the last week, remember, due to geopolitical factors, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more later, it suggests it's going to be harder for the government to sell their debts or it will have to pay more, which means the public finances look even worse. The British government issued £123 billion worth of gilts last year. We look on course to be issuing £300 billion worth of gilts this year, increasing our national debt mightily, even though it's already now topped the equivalent of 100% of GDP. So our debt pile is bigger than the size of our economy in a single year year that's a serious situation we're paying 89 billion pounds already each year on debt service Alison that's getting on for three times what we spend on defense it's more than we spend on schools which is morally outrageous in my view and now we're going to add even more to our debt and the markets may take umbrage you know the markets don't care if your name's Liz Truss or Rachel Reeves the markets don't care that Rachel Reeves used to work at the Bank of England and she's got a new haircut. They will take umbrage if the numbers don't add up. And the general overall Labour story of, yes, we want more growth, which makes the public finances look better, of course, but we're going to increase taxes from where they already are at a 70-year high, doesn't really add up. Obviously, I've got a lot to ask you about this, but something that's occurred to me is a lot of their money raising plans are coming unstuck, aren't they? So this VAT on private schools, that's going to run into a lot of legal challenge. It's a very, very spiteful move. And it will, in in fact, affect a lot of special needs children. So there are all sorts of people. It's not, as we've discussed before on the podcast, it's not all these very, very well endowed uber posh schools, is it? There's a lot of very, very ordinary. In fact, I've forgotten the name of this guy, but but it's very interesting that one of Labour's sort of Muslim MPs was really talking about this. and, And it is a fact that a lot of very aspirational people with small businesses, corner shops, many of them ethnic minority, are sent sending their children to smaller private schools and really tightening their belts, savings, not going on holiday so they can afford these private schools. So the VAT on private schools, which was, what was that? Can you remember what that was going to raise? It was going to raise about 1.7 billion, which was going to pay for 6,500 teachers, which is, you know, a very tiny percentage (laughs) of the number of teachers in the UK. But then also there's the non-doms, the penalising the wealthy. We're hearing stories every day now about millionaires leaving the UK because, of course, people with lots of money are highly mobile. So a lot of their measures, which were supposed to be filling this this alleged 22 billion gap that Rachel happened to find in the finances when she arrived in number 11, a a lot of those plans are are unravelling. And also last week, I'm sure you noticed, Liam, that just to try and fill in the 22 billion gap, 
gap in the economy, they launched a spending of twenty-two billion pounds on carbon capture, which is, which as far as I can work out, is done for free by trees. So a lot of their sort of adding up of sums doesn't seem to me to be very convincing. Indeed, Labour came into office and quote discovered a twenty-two billion pound black hole, which apparently explains why they are now going to put up taxes by a lot more than the nine billion of tax increases that they outlined in their manifesto because it was the Tories that covered up this black hole. A black hole which the IFS says, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, no friends of the Tories, independent body, very highly regarded, the IFS says that that black hole was, quotes, obvious to anyone who dared to look, unquote. But your instincts are right, Alison. A lot of the tax measures that Labour are bringing in, they've said they won't increase taxes on working people. That's their quote. So you would think that means income tax, VAT and national insurance. Though even if you don't raise the rate of income tax, you can, of course, mess with the thresholds in order to drag even more people into those tax thresholds. And even though national insurance isn't going to go up for working people, quotes, that doesn't mean it won't go up for employers. And I think that could well happen. But some of the other measures, you know, I'm a governor of an independent school, Our parent base is absolutely full of local business owners, people striving, first generation users of independent education. And to many of them, this seems like a very spiteful policy. Uh, And it's probably not going to raise much money for the Exchequer because there will be, I'm afraid, an exodus of some kids, many of whom have already had their education cynically disrupted by COVID, they will have to leave their schools because with the extra 20% on top, even if schools can absorb some of it, and it's hard for many schools because most of their cost base is staff. If you want to have to lay off staff, they run on very tight margins, if any margins. A lot of schools are going to suffer from pupils leaving who will have to be accommodated in the state sector and that will cost the state money. So just on capital gains tax, another thing that may happen, there are, there's analysis that's been leaked from the Treasury showing that even the Treasury boffins don't think it's going to raise any money because people will just, institutions will move things around, not sell things and so on. So very, Labour are very naively penciled in gains from tax rises, but yeah, these tax rises may not lead to any more revenue and they may even lead to less revenue. I just wanted to say, let's pause to savour the irony that Keir Starmer, when he was trying to explain away using Lord Ali's penthouse flat in Covent Garden, said that his son, who was revising for his GCSEs, couldn't be disrupted by the media outside the Starmer family home. So he had to have access to this Covent Garden penthouse for this period of time. That really got on your goat, that Covent Garden penthouse. (laughs) What? No, listen. It got on your, as I used to say in the 70s, it got on my wick. On my wick. There are, they, their policies. You don't hear that often, No, you lately. don't, do you? It got on my wick. On my wick. It's a good one, I like it. It did get on my wick. Yeah. And I tell you what, the lots of, the thousands of children who are going to have their education disrupted in the middle of a school year because their parents oh, can't afford. So, you know, young, you know, Starmer Jr. can't have his GCSE revision disrupted well hasn't Kentish Town got a library you know go and sit in there and but also just this idea that these thousands of kids you know I mean it's incredibly disruptive to have to change school lose your friendship groups and so on in January and we've had emails from parents where the children have had to leave state schools because they've had learning difficulties or they've been bullied and you know this is going to cause massive upset and pain and we could see I dread to say it, but we could see some children harming themselves. So don't give us some sob story trying to cover up your use of the on my wick Covent Garden penthouse. (laughs) Alison, we've got to leave it there. Time presses on and we didn't even get to mention the assisted dying bill, which I would say Labour spin doctors have bunged into the mix in order to try and get us all to stop talking about Sleazegate and Sue Gray. You know, I really never want to hear Sue Gray's name again. I've got nothing against the woman, but it's just just the way it dominates our national discourse. And, you know, who gives a monkeys about who Sue Gray is? You know, tell us about our electricity bills and the NHS and things we care about. This Sue Gray fixation, it just absolutely typifies 
Westminster's unrelenting focus on process and micro personalities rather than policy and what people really care about. Well, because I've got a very shallow mind, as, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> I always get it confused because Sue Ellen in Dallas was Linda Gray. <laughs> so she was Linda Gray. So I always think Sue Gray, Linda Ellen, Sue Ellen. But this is- And on that bombshell, though, I have to say, I was more of a Victoria principal oh, man. Oh, I bet you were. Myself, yeah, yes. yeah. Now it's time for our Planet Normal guest. Fantastic guest this week, as always. Brendan O'Neill grew up in North London, the child of Catholic Irish immigrants. He was the editor of the opinion website Spiked from 2007 to 2021, and he is now their chief political writer. Brendan writes regularly for The Spectator, as well as many other publications, and is a much sought after TV and radio pundit. Some of his collected writings were published last year in the excellent book, A Heretic's Manifesto, Essays on the Unsayable. Now Brendan has a fantastic new book out on a subject close to my heart, After the Pogrom, 7th of October, Israel and the Crisis of Civilization. I started by asking Brendan O'Neill what his reaction had been to the fact that the protests after the massacres of the 7th of October were against Israel. I, I was beyond horrified. I mean, I knew the reaction was going to be bad. I predicted it pretty early on that there would be apologism for what Hamas did, that there would be excuse making, that some people might even say it was an act of resistance. I knew those things were going to happen, but even I was shocked by what happened. Even my grim expectations were outdone. And as you say, there were protests against Israel almost immediately after the pogrom of 7th of October. So on the 9th of October, Outside the Israeli embassy in London, there was a gathering of people. And, and I think what people tend to forget is that that was a celebratory gathering. They were playing music. They were dancing. They were letting off fireworks. This was a pro-pogrom celebration on the streets of London in 2023. And I make the point in my book that we would remember if people in London poured onto the streets to celebrate Crystal Night. And so we should remember that they did it for 7th of October. We saw things like posters being put up of missing hostages, missing children, or only trying to raise awareness of these poor people who'd been torn from their homes, often had had family members murdered in front of them. And we saw apparently respectable British people peeling the posters down. Now, is, th is there nothing that could happen to Israel which would be bad enough that the Jews would deserve sympathy? That's the question we're left with. And, you know, it actually, it was when I saw all those posters being torn down, that's really the moment at which I thought, I've got to stop just feeling angry about this and get my thoughts together and potentially write a, something longer, i.e. a short book, which is what I've done, write something slightly longer about this whole thing. And I remember cycling around London and everywhere you look, you would see the remnants of these posters. You would see the kind of jagged claw marks where people had feverishly torn them down. They elicited this extraordinary, extraordinary hostility, this uh, kind of anger in people. And we've also seen the video clips of people tearing them down, clawing them down, writing colonizer across the faces of, you know, young children who were kidnapped by the fascists of Hamas. Do you remember they put Hitler moustaches on some little twins, didn't they? That's right. In Finchley Road, North London, uh, an area with a large Jewish population, there was a poster that featured the three-year-old twins kidnapped by Hamas and someone drew Hitler moustaches on them. I mean, that was really the moment at which I felt like I might lose faith in my own society. When you have such a grave attack on the Jews, the worst attack on the Jewish people since the Holocaust, and the Jews and their allies try to raise awareness about the attack and raise awareness about the hostages. And there are people in my city where I live who not only defaced and tore those posters down, but drew Hitler moustaches on them, essentially depicted young Jewish children as Nazis. I mean, it was repugnant and deeply concerning. It struck me that what they were doing was that, that they didn't like the posters because the posters were an unhelpful reminder that there were innocent children, young women, completely innocent people that were the victims. And of course, as you say so eloquently in your book, 
we live in a society where we're told don't blame the victim but Israel was clearly the victim on this occasion and that wasn't allowed was it no question you know i think one of the reasons the posters offended these lunatics so much is because it interfered with their narrative it, it interfered with the binary moral narrative that they've drawn up around this issue and around so many issues, which is that there is the oppressor and there's the oppressed. And the oppressor in this situation is always Israel. There's no other question that they will be willing to entertain. And so even when Israel was invaded, even when Israelis were kidnapped and raped and murdered, they still refused to say that these people were the victims. They still refused to say that in this case, Hamas were the oppressors, Hamas were the butchers, Hamas were the murderers, and Israelis were the victims. So the hostility to those posters is because they were such a profound confrontation to the idiot story that these people tell themselves about Israel-Gaza. We saw particularly young people, co groups of college students wearing these Hamas-style green bandanas that were the last thing that many Israelis saw who were murdered on 7th of October, these recreational kefiers tied around their necks. Progressive young people, always passionate about anti-racism, complaining about misogyny and homophobia. Yet there they were, as you say, Brendan, in the book, exulting in one of the worst acts of racist violence of modern times. Among the young, affinity with Hamas and its ugly aims was chillingly commonplace. What did you think that our youth is making common cause with basically men, let's face it, who would slit their naive leftist throats in a heartbeat, wouldn't they? Absolutely, they would. You know, the it's a it's a kind of suicidal politics in a way. You know, when you look at a group like Queers for Palestine, blissfully unaware that if they were ever to go to Gaza, they'd be thrown off the top of a building quicker than they could say "Free Palestine." <laughs> yeah, um, I made the, I made the point in my book that their pronouns would be "was were" very very quickly. <laughs> and yeah. you know, it's it, it's so true about the anti racism thing because we live in an era in which. Everything is referred to as racism. I think the word racism is used far too much, actually. You know, you you will remember when Lady Susan Hussey was chased out of Buckingham Palace because she yeah. asked a woman, where do you come from? Or, you know, if you criticize the Quran these days or any element of Islam, you'll be branded bigoted and Islamophobic. And Britain is continually branded an institutionally racist country, which I just don't think it is. And yet all these kind of self-satisfied pontificators against racism, people who see racism everywhere, they refuse to see it in this army of anti-Semites that invaded the world's only Jewish nation and killed more than a thousand people. That's when they stopped talking about racism. That's when they stopped talking about fascism. These people love to call things fascistic. They said the vote for Brexit was like the 1930s. Donald Trump was like Hitler. But when these Islamo-fascists killed more Jews in one day than anyone has since Hitler, suddenly they stopped talking about fascism and they made excuses for it. So the, the cant and the hypocrisy of these people has been exposed, I think, really, really well. The Guardian, I'm sure, regularly makes your blood boil as it does mine, but they they excelled themselves at the weekend on the anniversary of the of the massacres with a an article by Naomi Klein in which she basically chastised Israel for weaponizing <laughs> the <laughs> violence against them as if it wasn't bad enough that they'd suffered from mass murder, but they weren't allowed to mourn their own dead because that would make people feel bad. Brendan, I was wondering, there are... Iranian-backed organizations throughout the West that have popularized the term Islamophobia, which of course handily shuts down discussion about jihadists and the huge threat they pose to democratic societies like ours. Do you think fear of being seen to be Islamophobic is one reason that people have been reluctant to call out the barbarousness of 7th of October? I think so. Absolutely. I think, you know, I'm so wary of the term Islamophobia because I think there is such a thing as anti-Muslim bigotry, of course, just as there is anti-Semitism, anti-Catholic bigotry. There are forms of bigotry in our society which we should challenge whenever we can. But Islamophobia is something different. Islamophobia is a very cynically invented term. It's been promoted by Islamists and by the Iranian regime and, of course, by, by witless NGOs here in the UK. And it really is an edict, essentially, against any criticism or mockery or 
blasphemy essentially ag- against the Islamic religion, and and it has created this culture of cowardice and this culture of fear when it comes to public debate about this one religion and its ideas and its community practices, and that has I think created a situation where there are some influential people in politics, in the media, in activist circles who think that any criticism of Islamists is by definition problematic and possibly racist. And that means they're even unwilling to criticize a group like Hamas, which is clearly a murderous outfit devoted to the destruction of Jewish people. We, when Suella Braverman was the Home Secretary, you remember she, in fact, she was sacked by Rishi Sunak, partly for calling out this two-tier policing she was accusing the Metropolitan Police of. And Suella said, quite prophetically, that these Saturday pro-Palestine marches were going to get nastier and nastier. And this weekend, we, I put some placards, you and I were down in Hyde Park, Brendan, for a commemorative event for the Jewish community. And there were placards, I love Hezbollah. Now, in other European countries, these marches were stamped out by the police very quickly, lots of graphic footage of French police doing what they do and and dragging these people away. Why didn't the British political class take action? And what do you think about the police, the Met, particularly not arresting people who are clearly supporting terrorists? I mean, what are are they afraid? The two-tier policing is real and two-tier justice is real. You know, to to my mind, the best example of it is that in January this year, a man with a knife went into a kosher store in Golders Green and he jabbed the knife towards the Jewish people in there and said, tell me your views on Israel and Gaza right now. He got a suspended sentence. He was let out, essentially. You fast forward to the post-riots atmosphere and people will remember that a 53-year-old woman who was the sole carer for her disabled husband was jailed for 15 months instantly instantly put to jail for writing something on Facebook. Now, what she wrote on Facebook was horrible. There's no question about that. But we have a situation now where a man who aims a knife at Jews is given a suspended sentence and a woman who says stupid stuff on on the internet is put in jail. So two-tier justice is a real problem. And I think it really was demonstrated by the police's attitudes to these demonstrations because on these hate marches, and I think Suella Bravum was right to call them hate marches, yeah, so do I. we saw people, you know, we saw people se- openly celebrating fascistic movements. We saw people celebrating Hezbollah, Hamas. We saw legions of England's middle classes idly marching shoulder to shoulder with these radical Islamists, which I think is unforgivable. And if there had been you know, beer bellied so called gammon on the streets as they are, you know, singing the praises of the Nazi party or singing the praises of Hitler, they would not only have been arrested, they would have been truncheoned off the streets. So the double standards from the cops is unquestionable now. And it really raises uh, serious questions about the future of Britain. You write very, very brilliantly in the book about the moral failure of the West. And you quote examples of teachers and professors cultivated individuals we all look to for educated, nuanced views. I mean, encouraging a pylon on Israel. One professor at Cornell University, one of the greatest universities in the United States, said the horrific acts by Hamas were nonetheless exhilarating and energizing. Those who fail to feel stirred by Hamas's actions, by its challenge to the monopoly on violence, are not fully human. Well, I'm not long back from Israel, Brendan, where I was talking to individuals who'd survived those energizing and exhilarating acts. I mean, my God, what is the point of defending Western civilization if its leading intellectuals hold views as mad, cruel, and warped as that? I mean, exactly right. And what you wrote about your trip to Israel was extraordinarily powerful. And loads of people I know have mentioned it to me and and are talking about it. And you really capture the depravity of what occurred in that country on 7th of October and the impact that it had on the Jewish people who live in that country. And to see, you know, if we go back a year to 8th of October, 9th of October, 10th of October, 2023, there were prominent voices in universities, in left-wing circles, in activist circles, who didn't only make excuses for this violence, but celebrated it. 
No, people will remember that someone at Navara Media referred to it as a day of celebration. And as you say, that there were many university professors and academics and students who celebrated it as a wonderful act of resistance. And, you know, they're still doing that. So at Columbia University in New York City this week, on Monday, the 7th of October, when Jewish students there were holding a vigil for the hostages and for the people who were murdered a year ago, a huge gang, a huge mob of pro-Palestine students came out and started chanting, resistance is glorious. So Jews aren't even allowed to grieve in peace. You know, firstly, they're told they're not allowed to stand up for themselves against the Islamist armies that surround the Jewish state. Then they're told they're not allowed to have their own homeland, as every other people in the world is allowed to do. And now they're not even allowed to grieve. Now, even on the first year anniversary of the pogrom, even that is hijacked by activists and agitators and the pro-Palestine set who want to bash the Jewish state once again. So the unfairness of this, the grotesqueness of it, is something I think we still haven't really come to terms with as a society, and a lot more needs to be talked about in order to fix these problems. I am hoping, indeed I am praying, that the vast majority of British people look on some of these marches and think, God, can they not just shut up? Because I think actually I detect a, a, a growing dislike for what, what I see now as sort of a public bullying or thuggery. There's a particularly brilliant paragraph in a book full of brilliant paragraphs. You say, this is what we need to talk about. It seems to me that the post-October hysteria was the rotten fruit of the West's turn against civilization, of our creeping abandonment of reason of our trading of the Enlightenment ideals of rational thought and democratic deliberation for the dead end of identity politics and competitive grievance. Having schooled the new generation to be sceptical of the gains of civilization, we cannot now be surprised that some seem tempted by the lure of barbarism. Brendan, given that we've got a Labour government which is signed up to this pernicious anti-Western, anti-white nonsense, what can be done to fight back? Even though I strike a note of despair in my book, because I have felt quite despairing over the past year, I do still feel quite optimistic. I do think that there is a lot we can do to push back, Alison. And you've been pushing back and I've been pushing back and there are other people out there Lots of Jewish groups, there are lots of new groups that are aligning themselves with the Jews and saying, we stand shoulder to shoulder with you. You know, one of the things I was very privileged to do after 7th of October last year, I was invited to speak at quite a few synagogues and in Jewish people's homes to give my thoughts on what had happened. And to be able to stand in front of large groups of Jews and say, listen, there are non-Jews out there who have your back. That was actually one of the great privileges of my working life. And you're absolutely right. There are huge numbers of people out there who feel similarly, who are sick and tired of these hate marches, who don't accept the idea that Hamas is a normal political group or certainly not a good political group, and who recognize that radical Islam poses a pretty significant threat, not only to Israel, but to the Western world more broadly, and who don't like this turn against Western civilization, this culture war against British history, against the wonders and gains of British history. They don't like all this stuff, the tearing down of statues, the defamation of the of Britain's past, the depiction of Britain as a horrible country born from the sin of colonialism and empire and slavery. They don't like this stuff. And they're out there. They might be a silent majority at the moment, but I think when push comes to shove, they will speak up. And you're right, we're now run by a government that is sympathetic to all these anti-Western, anti-civilization views who are on the wrong side of the culture war. And I think that could make more Brits feel even more agitated and lead to something of a rebellion against this creepy culture. When I was in Israel, I visited the amazing Yad Vashem Holocaust uh, Museum, and it was full on that day. It's full of young IDF soldiers, you know, kids who just come out of high school. They were sort of, they look so young, Brendan. They're probably only about 17, 18. And about 95% of them, they weren't white colonialists. I mean, they were clearly Middle Eastern. Many of them were African, Somalian Jews, Ethiopian Jews, and of course, Bedouin Arabs. It's a fact that's little known and should be more known that of about 440 orphans who were created on October the 7th, 66 were Arabs, Muslim babies and children. All right. They didn't just kill Jews, these monsters. But just uh, coming to an, an end now, I could go on talking to you all day. When I was in Israel, Brendan, practically everyone I interviewed, young and old, said, don't think this is just about us. Don't think it will stop with the Jews. The UK 
is at threat from extremists, from fundamental Islam. How big do you think is that threat to our society going forward? It's a huge threat. And it's a threat that, uh, I mean, it's most threatening towards Israel. They are surrounded virtually on all sides by hostile armies of radical Islamists and anti-Semites. And they have every right, I think, to fight against those enemies and we should support them all the way. But radical Islam is a threat in the West as well. And, you know, let's not forget that in Britain, since 2005, around 100 people have been killed by radical Islamists. That's a lot of people. In Europe, it's hundreds and hundreds, especially in France, but in other countries as well, Spain, Belgium, even Finland. You know, it's a problem. It's, it poses a direct threat of violence, but I think it also poses a threat in terms of its undermining of the institutions of Western society, the way in which radical Islam convinces people to hate the West, to hate the countries in which they live. So it is a very poisonous threat to the values of civilization and the virtues of enlightenment and the things that we should celebrate. And this comes back to a point you made earlier, Alison, about the dangers of a term like Islamophobia, because the more that we are censored, the more that we are silenced, the more that we are told, don't look back in anger, don't talk about these terrible things that happen, just move on, lay a flower when there's a terrorist attack and then get on with your life. The more we are told to adopt that position, the more we won't have the deep honest, frank discussions we need about what is going wrong in our societies, the threats we face, and how we might tackle them. So the first step to all of this is really to value freedom of speech, freedom of thought, and the right of everyone in Britain to criticise some of the trends that we're seeing. Finally, we were having a laugh, weren't we, on Sunday about how you, me, Liam, we seem to end up on the same naughty step over many issues. You were alongside us in the lockdown, anti-lockdown trenches, weren't you? And I just want to say that you are a perfect citizen of Planet Normal, honestly, and I'm so glad we've got your, your heft and your intellect and your wonderful reason you know, it's lovely to have a great comrade like that, and and particularly with this burning issue, which we both feel so strongly about. Brendan, it's an absolutely uh, brilliant book. After the pogrom, seventh of October, Israel and the crisis of civilization is available now, soon on Amazon. Tell me, it's available right now on Amazon and. Alison, if I have to sit on a naughty step, I can think of no one better to sit on it with than you and Liam. So thank you for inviting me onto the step. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you, darling. Thank you so much. Thank you. So there you have it, Brendan O'Neill discussing his fantastic new book with me. I have to say, Liam, always find myself almost always in agreement with Brendan, as we were joking, often find ourselves on the same naughty step, contrarians really, in an era of groupthink. But one reason I'm grateful for his book, I think, is because, as you know, I've been to Israel recently and done a couple of really huge, substantial pieces about what actually happened on the 7th of October. And I think what Brendan does is he drags it back to what was the cause of what we've seen now for the last year? Where did it begin? And of course, it began with profoundly harrowing and deeply sad things that I wrote about in pieces in The Telegraph over the weekend, which listeners will be able to access in the show notes. I thought those pieces were incredibly moving, Alison. It shows that you're not just a, you know, a formidable opinion writer. You're a damn good gumshoe reporter as well, on the ground reportage, which I don't think journalists do enough of these days. And it was great to see you doing that, even though I know it was a very harrowing experience for you. I mean, I'd say that this war in the Middle East, Israel and Iran exchanging missiles for the second time in just a few months, it is putting upward pressure on oil prices. It is changing the geopolitical landscape. It does mean it's going to be harder for the Bank of England uh, possibly to lower interest rates and harder for the Western world to get going in terms of ec economics. I know it sounds callous to talk about these pecuniary things when you've been focusing on the human bloodshed and suffering, but this is how politics works. It is going to be a bumpy final quarter. The, that was the subject of my column last Sunday for the global economy, for the UK economy and for UK politics too. But crikey, I think it's going to be pretty exciting as well. 
I don't think it's heartless, Liam, and, and obviously it's going to have huge ramifications, not least in our country where, as we discussed last week about the crusade towards net zero, closing down our last coal-fired power station, which is, you know, we're, we're really heading up for squeaky bum time, I think, with uh, and one thing I've done, which listeners might enjoy, is I've started a bit of a sweepstake going on when we can expect Mad Ed's first power cut So if you would like to join in with the sweepstake, do write in. We're going to have to come up with a suitable prize. And we've had some wonderful responses, Liam, to the net zero discussion with various people suggesting nicknames for Ed. And the winner, I'm going to say, is Jeff, who has come up with Thoroughly Mental Millie, as opposed to Thoroughly Modern Millie, which is great. And the prize (laughs) for winning the sweepstakes will be a Planet Normal Blackout survival kit. <laughs> You'll get a torch with batteries. You'll get an Ina Blyton novel, a candle, and some swan vestas so you can light the candle. Right, Alison? Well, we we did talk, didn't we? Because if it's going to be back to all the in 70- an oxo tin, back to the seventies, we're going to be we're going to be. So uh, lots of people have been writing in. I think we should. Anyone who's got memories of power cuts, please do send in your tips. We've got a couple of those coming up in the emails. But we were laughing, weren't we, about with our beans on toast that we'd actually be sitting eating Finder's crispy pancakes in the dark, <laughs> which will be peak nineteen seventies. I love a bit of Arctic roll. <laughs> Now on to our listener emails sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We'd love to hear from you, the citizens of Planet Normal. Lots of response to the Tory leadership contest. Major Harry says, I'm with Alison. I voted Conservative for over 30 years. I'm a party member. I've gritted my teeth as one nation wets have have left the party with no identity. (laughs) James Cleverly, however, will be the end. I will leave for Reform UK. Well, Harry, you've been saved from that. Winston says, my local association chairman wrote and said, now is a good time to rejoin the Tory party. I wrote back and said, I'll wait and see. Thanks. Too many in the Westminster bubble still don't realise that winning from the centre is based on where the electorate is, not where the bubble is. And that's a theme, that's one of your major themes, Liam. And Victoria says... Alison articulated perfectly the self-delusion of Tory MPs in propelling James Cleverly to the top of the leadership stakes. I must admit, I found myself channeling my inner John McEnroe. They cannot be serious. Unfortunately, the ball was on the line. The ball was on the Shot line. Shot flew up. Oh, we do miss him, don't we? <laughs> Unfortunately, says Victoria, these MPs who constitute the remnants of a once great political force are little more than self-serving, arrogant fools who somehow imagine that this man who lacks the flair, intelligence and imagination to lead anything, a genial duffer, <laughs> she, she, she likes him as much as me, will, would be a serious leader of the opposition and take the fight to an inept, hypocritical and vindictive Labour government. Anyway, no matter what ordinary former Tory voters like me think about things, apparently people like me are right-wing nutters, you and me both, Victoria. I've had it, off to reform. Well, people like that, Liam, <clears throat> may, be, may be slightly rethinking. Can we just make the point, which we didn't make at the top, which is that if Kemi uh, Badenoch were to become the leader of the opposition, she as a black woman would be diversity top trumps and she would be Keir Starmer's worst nightmare. Here's a double poetic offering for Planet Normal listeners, you lucky people. Bob the Bard's got a challenger. Another one, it's David in Monmouth, who's written a verse, Starmer's People. Junior doctors, engine drivers, teachers all do pretty well. Workers in the public sector... These are Labour's clientele. Summer's over, autumn's coming, winter months will bring the cold. Pensioners will then be punished for the crime of growing old. Oh, very good. Very good, David. And Bob the Bard is back. By handing in the Chagos Islands to an ally of China, says Bob, it's clear Britain's finally ditched the Union Jack in favour of the white flag. I therefore think we should also replace our national anthem with something more appropriate. Thanks again for Planet Normal, the one piece of territory that we shall never surrender. (laughs) The white flag. And here it is. Our nation's flag is purest white, which fills our foes with sheer delight. We'll give away our territory to allies of our enemies. 
Security's an afterthought. Just bend the knee to foreign courts. So while we're ruled by traitor Keir, we'll keep the white flag flying here. Ta-da! Lots and lots of uh, correspondence on Mr. Thoroughly Mental Milliband and my sweepstake. So G says, power cuts are coming. My son told me to get a, a wood burner as the last government and this one have zero idea what they're doing. He's a consultant in the energy industry. It seems that my son and his colleagues are all planning for power cuts. Morons are all following the net zero cult. Paul says, hi, both. Just listened to last week's Planet Normal while pretending to work and getting increasingly furious. Forget AI as a driver of a greater electrical demand. Adding heat pumps and home EV charges to each home in the UK increases the electrical demand about two and a half times. See a requirement calculation for a four-bedroom house, and Paul provides that below. And multiply by 28 million households, maybe a slightly smaller multiplier, as the average house isn't four beds. But you get the point. The electricity has to be distributed from new sources, e.g. wind farms in different locations, to the current sources, e.g. coal-fired power stations. So the grid has become obsolete in design, as well as short on capacity to make matters even worse. And this is one you'll like, Liam. This is from Diane, <clears throat> harking back to the 70s. My mother had the schedule of power cuts up on, up on the wall in our kitchen, says Diane. I used to check up which nights it was going to be impossible to do my homework and reschedule my own plan as there were no excuses for late homework in those days. I might even have to try and do some in the lunch break. Keir Starmer's junior son, learn a lesson there. Food, says Diane, <clears throat> was cooked on a small camping stove, usually soup and sandwiches eaten in front of a colour gas heater. The open fire had been replaced with the gas one some years earlier. The positive memories include playing card board games by candlelight. As the block blackouts were scheduled, at least you knew what to expect. It was the 4 to 8 p.m. blackout, which was the most inconvenient. It was not all bad. But of course, we are now far more dependent on power than we ever were then. Very good point, Liam. And finally, Alison, this is from Bruce. The Conservative Party conference may seem an odd place to be when searching for salvation, but I'm glad I was there, says Bruce, rubbing shoulders with many a soulmate, looking for glimmers of life amongst the embers of a once great party. It was a pleasure, too, to chat with Liam at length, who's such a charmer that he excoriated a Robert Jenrick staffer to the extent that the staffer said he would happily vote for Liam should he ever pursue a political career. <laughs> Vibrant of the conference was... Given the leadership hustings, the divisions and factualisms were still only too obvious. I noticed that the Conservative Environment Network had their own hall with five events a day, tempting the question, who funds you? I attended the first entitled Is Net Zero a Conservative Mission? The excellent Lord Frost, he of Planet Normal, locked horns with Sam Richards, once Boris Johnson's energy advisor. Other than Father Stanley, should we ever be in doubt where Boris drew his delusional ideas of a Saudi Arabia of wind? We need look no further than young Sam. The mix of denial and disingenuousness... Dis, blah, blah, blah. The mix of denial and disingenuousness, says Bruce, was apparent as he first exclaimed that North Sea oil and gas reserves were spent, then under questioning from the excellent Catherine McBride failed a maths test. But coming back to the question, of course, net zero is not a conservative mission, you fools. It involves market distortions that short-circuit the free market. It involves vast taxpayer-funded subsidies. It's not in the national interest. It's a one-dimensional environmental trade-off which devastates natural habitats. It's never been democratically challenged. I could go on, says Bruce, but I might self-combust. Increasing my personal carbon footprint and putting myself in trouble with the authorities. Best wishes. And on that bombshell... That's it from Planet Normal for another week as we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views. Email of the week, it's my turn. Bruce, Bruce, before you self-combust, fill a Planet Normal mug with water and pour it over your head to calm down. Oh, you haven't got a Planet Normal mug. Well, if you want one, Bruce, having been selected as email of the week, send us your postal address in an email to planetnormal.telegraph.co.uk. Put in the email subject heading mug winner. And we will send 
a Planet Normal mug to you. If you enjoy Planet Normal, jolly well hope you do, please leave us a re- rating and review on Spotify, the podcast app, or wherever you listen to this podcast. It does really help other people to find us. And some Planet Normal news. Alison and I will be staging a live recording of Planet Normal at the Battle of Ideas Festival in Westminster, Central London, on Sunday, the 20th of October. That's right. We'll be hosted by our friends and the Battle of Ideas, led by Planet Normal super regular Pearson stand-in, Baroness Claire Fox. And we'll be recording at 11am on Sunday, the 20th of October. Absolutely fantastic, action-packed weekend if you want to come along. But if you'd specifically like to join Liam and I, please do go to battleofideas.org.uk. That's battleofideas.org.uk. We'll put the link in the show notes to this episode. It would be really nice to see you at such a cracking weekend. And Planet Normal listeners can get 20% off all categories of tickets to the Battle of Ideas if they use the code Planet Normal 24, that's Planet Normal 24, that's the Battle of Ideas, as Alison says, held over the weekend of Saturday the 19th and Sunday the 20th of October. Many, many, many discussions, seminars, events, and the Hooligans will be playing at the Battle of hey, Ideas. Oh, that's wow. the, the Halligan family band. We'll be doing some diddly die music, getting Westminster's finest and indeed Planet Normal's finest up on their hind legs. And dancing, that's on the Saturday night. As we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal, the madness of Planet Earth comes back into view. Thanks as ever to our producers, Isabel Bouchard, Elliot Lampett, Cass Ho, and Louisa Wells. Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other. Until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him.